Help your sister. She's got those ten foot stilts on. She had those red shoes on down in Logan, West Virginia. We'd walked, we were holding camp meeting down there. We went into a restaurant afterward. And there was a group of uh, young uh, African American black young ladies sitting there in their school. Just had their first football game. And my daughter walked by in her stilts. And she looked at them. She doesn't know a stranger. She's a lot like me, and we can just we can make a best friend, you know, just you know there. And she's like, "Hey, girls, how you doing?" And they're like, "Ooh, we love your shoes. We love your shoes." And uh, she said, "Well, my family sings, and my mom and my brother just left, and they just went out to the car." And this girl goes, "That was your brother that was in here?" She said, "Yeah, that was my brother." She said, "Girl, he made me drop my sauce." <laughs> so the sauce dropper. So I went out. We got boy wonder. And his mother, she came back in, we came back in, we gathered around that table with my preaching friend. And these, we started singing, I live to tell about it, right, right there in Wendy's. And it was packed, it was packed, so we, we sang a chorus for him. And all of a sudden, this young girl looked at my preaching friend, he, and she said, you pray for my cousin, would you pray for my cousin? He has cancer real bad. Brother Bill says, you want us to pray for your cousin? She said, yes, yeah, he's got cancer real bad. Bill looked at me and said, she wants prayer. So when Bill says they want prayer, he meant it. And I joined with him and we prayed right there with a group of complete strangers sharing them Jesus Christ. Isn't God good? God's wonderful. I thank the Lord. I appreciate my kids. I don't even know if they know it's sibling day. Um, sometimes they'll giggle and they'll laugh and they'll just make one of he'll, Samuel's funny. Uh, you don't hardly hear a peep out of him. And when you do, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, he, he's got humor. I, I don't know where he gets it from. But he, he gets funny and he, he, he makes her laugh. And uh, it's not always been like that. Um, I, I remember he had a water hose one day, and he was just gently spraying his sister. She gets the power washer, and she sprays him with the power washer. Samuel takes off galloping like a stallion. He's like, oh, woo, woo. We thought she had killed him. She was wailing and weeping. There was gnashing of teeth that day. But he was all right. They've grown up pretty good. The same preacher that was the pastor that had the brain tumor that we were praying for his healing, we'd went to many doctors and they said, hey, anybody else here need any kind of a miracle? It's not just about Brother Paul. And uh, we held hands. My wife and I held hands. And I had a dream in my dream that I was calling my friend, and I called Scott, and I said, we're pregnant. Sandy and I are having a baby, and we're having a girl. Well, we hadn't even uh, bought the 1,237th pregnancy test yet to find out if she was pregnant. And lo and behold, on a Wednesday night prayer meeting, she called me, and she said, I'm, I'm pregnant. Well, I called EPT. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it was right. I'm a pharmacist, and I wanted to make sure that line was not lying to me. And uh, so God blessed us with, with these wonderful children. They're 16 months apart. Uh, they're not married. They're, they're, they don't have boyfriends and girlfriends. Uh, I tell people all the time, I've got applications in the back. If you'd like to have one, we'll, we'll take them. Uh, our criteria is high. Uh, I tell you right now, we, I, I'm not raising uh, little uh, varmints. I'm not raising pets. I'm raising children in the image and the fear of God. I'm not just giving them over to anybody and anything. 
I tell them all the time, somebody's raising my daughter-in-law and somebody's raising my son-in-law and either it's taken them a hard time to learn everything they need to know and their parents are going bonkers with them or it's me and your mother. I think it's me and my, my wife. But uh, it'll, it'll all happen all in God's timing. I tell you how sweet this boy is. He probably gets that from me. But um, she's had a couple. She, she, she had one boyfriend for two or three months. And she's never really uh, dated, dated much. And had a couple guys that, you know, I tell her all the time. I said, there's bullfrogs on every lily pad. And just because you kiss them doesn't mean they're going to turn into a prince. Well, there was a good-looking guy come around, and he wanted to take her out on Valentine's Day. Well, nobody wants to be single on Valentine's Day. or be, And, you know, that was honoring. Boy, went to Bible college, this and that. But she knew in her heart it wasn't right. And so she had to tell him, no, I, I don't, there's nothing going to happen here. And all of a sudden, she gets flowers on Valentine's Day. And uh, Samuel boy there sent her flowers and said, thank you for not settling for a dud. <laughs> oh, he's so sweet. I've got good kids. I've got a good wife, a good mom. She was born to be a mother, and she has raised these kids. Uh, we went to a comedian uh, act the other day. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Tim Hawkins. And we never get it. We never get a chance to go uh, do anything like that. And we just made time to do it. I think people need to laugh. Uh, we're just. We're just. Sometimes we just get. We just lose our laughter. We lose our joy. Uh, and just in the hustle and bustle and the hostility of life, everybody's mad out there, and it rubs off on us. And before you know it, we're mad. And we're not glad, and we're sad, and we're grouchy, and we're ready to just like uh, karate chop somebody in the juggler vein, you know, just uh, because they forgot put, to put the pickles on our Big Mac or something. But anyway, uh, where am I going with that story at? <laughs> we were with Tim Hawkins. We were with Tim Hawkins the other day, and uh, he was talking about waking up uh, his mother. And he said, I used to be scared to death to wake up my mother. And he said, you just gently touch her. And he said, and all of a sudden, a, a beast would come out of her voice. And it just cracked my kids up. But anyway, we'll just leave that where it's at. Mama likes her sleep. And we all need that. Turn your Bibles to James chapter 3 tonight. If you love the Lord, let's stand together. We're going to read His Word. If you don't love the Lord, stand if you can. The Lord loves you. Turn around to somebody and smile at them. Look at somebody and say, Oh, please pray for the preacher. And turn back around and say, oh, please pray for me. He's going to preach on the tongue. I don't hear any of you. Oh. I told you I went to a Japanese restaurant and I've always had trouble with my speech. That I had a Spanish ministry at the church. About the only Spanish word I knew was gracias. And there I was at a Japanese restaurant and the young lady was pointing to where the bathroom was because she knew I needed to go. And I looked at her and I, I went gracias. And I kept walking and I thought, idiot, she is not Spanish. Hispanic. I went to college. I'm from Appalachia. And all of you people are saying we're northerners and this and that. And Caleb wanted to know if I liked tea. Do you like tea? Yes, yeah, sweet tea, sweet tea. He was trying to figure out my, I, I don't have an accent. And I'm like, well, everybody's got an accent. I went away to college, northern Ohio. I'm from southern Ohio. And I looked at guys that lived in the next room next to me and my uh, roommate. And I said, Yun's going to go to lunch? And they're like, Yun's? What's a yuns? 
I'm like, that's like you guys. Our yun's going to go eat. They're like, we've never heard of that. I'm like, I reckon you're not going, but I'm going to go eat. I reckon. What's reckon? <laughs> we all have our language, and we pick up things. We pick up things from one another. You hang out with somebody long enough, you'll start sounding like them. Dress like them, talk like them. You'll say phrases. Before you know it, somebody says, you sound like such and such. That's why you parents need to watch what you're saying. Because your little girl, she's going to be you. And your boy's going to be you. Pray for these kids. Father, help us tonight, in the name of Jesus, I pray, to preach the truth, Lord, nothing but it. I ask you, Lord, to help us tonight, that, Lord, we'd be better people. Save anybody to be lost here tonight. I pray that, Lord, we'd share our story with the unsaved. I understand that, Lord, you saved to the uttermost, and, Lord, you'd, you'd cleanse anyone tonight. I pray that, God, Lord, when we leave this place... Our tongue will be a, a member in our body that is used to edify, glorify, to elevate the name of Jesus Christ to a world that needs to hear. There is a remedy to this brokenness, and His name is Jesus. We love you, Lord, tonight, and we pray that you would help us in the name of Jesus, we pray. Let's remain standing just for a moment. Turn back to James chapter 1 uh, with me for time's sake. Verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Verse 22, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in what? In vain. You may be seated tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity or love, I'm become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, I don't want to be a shotgun preacher tonight. I like to be a sharpshooter and I just like to hit the target. There's a couple things that I need to talk about. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing cometh by the Word of God. And so we're wanting our faith to be stirred tonight in revival meeting Monday night. Everybody has a member behind that white picket fence called your teeth. Whether they're fake, false, been fortified, or been uh, white crest strips put on them today, behind those teeth is a little troublemaker. Now you might not have trouble with your... But I've had trouble with mine. I'm like the person that was praying, Oh God, I thank you for this day. It's been a good day. You've given me rest and you've given me strength. Lord, I've not crossed my eye at anybody today. You've been with me. I've not thought anything wrong. I've not kicked the dog. I've not said one contrary word to anybody. I've been kind, gentle, and good. And I thank you for your grace and your mercy. But Lord, I'm about ready to get up out of bed and start my day. And I need you to put your big hand around my shoulder and wrap it around until you get to that door of my mouth and put your hand on it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
Maybe you didn't pray that prayer today. Maybe you should have. Hearing and speaking go hand in hand. And if you're hearing what thus saith the Lord, our speech becomes a little bit more seasoned with the B-I-B-L-E and a little less seasoned with the things of the world. But you have the power in your tongue to even speak blessings and cursings upon people. I don't know who came up with that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, apparently... They've never been through a political presidential debate in the United States of America. If I say lying, you're going to say lying, Ted. Lying, Ted. If I say crooked, you're going to say... If I say little, you're going to say... Marco, yeah. See how words... Now let me go over that again. I lost you. Words have power. And all of a sudden, Ted Cruz was lying, Ted. All of a sudden, Hillary was crooked Hillary. All of a sudden, he was little Marco. Now we have President Trump. Words have power. Your words have power to edify, to tear down, to build up, to demolish to destroy, to bring back. Your words can cause division in your home. Your speech can cause a stir in your classroom. In the ladies' group, you can be the peace speaker or you can be the troublemaker. Wouldn't you like to be known as the children of God who are the peacemakers. Amen. And a lot of times we say things before we even weigh out our words of what we say. We just blurt out stuff that comes to us. I remember when I worked at Ponderosa. It it was a steakhouse in southern Ohio. I don't know if you have any Ponderosas or Bonanzas. They've been either one. And I was 18 years old and I knew everything at that point in my life. And I was, I was a waiter and I went around with a tie and a big thing of fresh coffee. And I helped everybody that had any kind of a problem. I'd help them to sit down. I'd make sure they had fresh rolls, this and that. And one day there was a lady, I think she was Godzilla's twin, and she was looking at me. She was so mean looking, and she had her napkin over her plate. Say something like this, and, I, and she went. And so here I come. Over there, and my manager was with me, and, and, and he was about probably six years older than me. And this lady looked at he and I, and she said, I want you to take the napkin off of my plate. And I just gently took the napkin off of her plate, and I kid you not, the biggest horse fly I'd ever seen had drowned in her apples, and there that fly was turned upside down looking at me, and I looked at it, and I went, Herman! And then I smiled. Then I learned what it meant to have somebody fly in your face. And my boss says, take the plate back to the back, please. I go back there, I'm just happy-go-lucky. I I was just trying to lighten the mood. And he come back and he said, Are you serious? He said, that woman is so mad and you just saw that horse fly and you thought you just found your long lost best friend and you hollered out Herman at a fly. I said, I was just trying to cheer her up a little bit. 
And then he gave me this, it's going to snowball and that kind of stuff. I don't know. I've never had very, I've, I've just not done very good with my tongue. It's always getting me in trouble. You probably don't have any trouble with your tongue. But you know, you can backbite with it. You can become a bully with it. You can get a critical spirit. I'm preaching revival. And I want to leave you something that will help you when we're gone. And I understand that sometimes we might have good intentions, but we need to be like Rhonda that came to the pharmacy. Rhonda had cerebral palsy. Rhonda would come in in her little motorized chair with her caregiver. She had her baby doll strapped in her motorized chair. And every time she saw me, she would, her hands would be out. I'd have to come down. She wanted to hug on me. She wanted to love on me. She wanted to know if I had any new music to give her. And she had a sore on her tongue. And she said, I need something for my tongue. And so I went to aisle seven. And there, Rhonda and I found what she needed for her tongue. And I said, now this will help the sore on your tongue. Well, just, just like a little child, she looked up at me and she said, would you pray for my tongue? I started laughing. I said, you pray for my tongue. Amen. And I say tonight, we need our tongue prayed for. Would somebody shake your head up and down? And, and don't look over at your spouse right now, but we need to have God to help us. There was a lady, she was such a windbag. She talked and gossiped so much about the pastor. And he got sick of it. She was constantly, girls, girls. I think the pastor's seeing other women. I saw his car. I saw his car. His car was over at her house. I saw it. And then she'd come back. And the pastor was visiting people. And he was using wisdom and doing that. And she just kept stirring this up. Well, the pastor got fed up with it. So he took his car to her house. And he parked it there for six days. She come back and she said, Preacher, preacher, preacher. I'm so sorry. I have sinned with my tongue. I have slandered you and I have gossiped and I have lied with my tongue and I need to get my tongue on the altar. And he said, honey, there ain't an altar long enough to get your tongue on. <laughs> you having trouble with your tongue? Maybe you're like me when Rhonda says, hey... Do you pray for my tongue? Maybe we need to pray for one another. There's a man in the Bible. He had a speech problem because he was deaf. Hearing and speaking go hand in hand. If you don't hear right, you won't speak right. Now I believe this man, Mark's the only one that records this miracle. And Mark says, They bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him, referring to Christ. This man was deaf and had a problem with his tongue. There was a boy at my church... That wasn't speaking right. So that one of the first things the doctor did was to order hearing tests. Because we want our children, we get right in their faces when they're little and we go, da da, da da, say da da. And it's a competition. Moms are going, mama, mama. And then they burp. And we say, ha! Ah! They said, Dad, right there. You know, we, but we try to teach them because they hear us saying things. That's why we have to be careful in the church what we're saying with little lambs around. 
because they're picking up from us what to say. And sometimes they're picking up what we don't want them to say. I, I've, I've had trouble with my hearing. If you'll notice, I almost put my head down in the monitor sometimes. I'll turn my head like this because this ear hears better than this ear. I, I had, I've got a mom and dad that had a baby when I went to college. I have an older brother and an older sister. My mother called me when I was a freshman in college, 19 years old, squalling, squalling, crying. I'm like, I think my grandpa has died. I'm like, Mom, what's wrong? She's like, I'm pregnant. I'm like, you're pregnant. What's wrong with that? I don't want to be. She was 45. My dad was 49. And now I've got this little brother who's 30 years old, 19 years younger than what I am. He's 31. So I joined the Army Guard to get through college. I couldn't pass the hearing test to become a combat engineer, so they sent me to field cannoneer school, and they have ruined this ear. Boom, and it's gone. We wanted to buy a piece of property off of a man. He was as deaf. I mean, he could be sitting in the, in the wheel of a, of, a, of a Boeing 747 in the middle of the jet, and he could not hear that engine running. He was that deaf. I'm sitting in there in his house going, Mr. McLaughlin, I want to buy your land. And he'd look at me. Your property. And I try to get him to understand. And he goes, I've got five hearing aids. And none of them work. He didn't have any of them in. I said, you might want to get one. Put it in there. <laughs> and try it out. Here comes a guy to Jesus who was deaf and had an impediment of speech. Quickly, let me go through the miracle. They brought a man who had trouble speaking and hearing to Jesus. In 1985, in New Philadelphia, Ohio, 200 lifeguards, gathered at a pool. They had had a whole year of success. No accidents. No tragedies. And they celebrated a successful year at the New Philadelphia, Ohio pool with no accidents. 200 lifeguards. And when those 200 lifeguards began to exit, they noticed there was a 31-year-old named Jeremy Moody who had slipped in the deep end of the pool and drowned while 200 lifeguards celebrated a year of victory and success. I'm afraid what I'm seeing in a lot of the churches is a group of people that's gotten happy and contented with being blessed on yesterday's blessings and looking at what their hands have been able to do and they have forgotten that they heard the voice of God one day calling them to come to Him and that He gave the marching orders for us to go out into the highways and the hedges and begin to compel people to come to Him. And we've gotten comfortable, casual. And there's people like Jeremy that are dying lost without God. We have a group of people here that are bringing a man to Jesus who was deaf and who had an impediment of speech. They had a belief in this one named Jesus. If they could get him to Jesus, Jesus could make him whole. 
Do you believe that the Lord can save your spouse? Do you still believe that the Lord can save your grandma and your grandpa, your brother and your sisters, your cousins by the dozens, your aunts and uncles, your neighborhood, red, yellow, brown, black and white, they're all precious in God's sight. Will somebody allow the Lord to touch their tongue and touch their ear to where you hear what thus saith the Lord that you can go out and you begin to see people as Christ sees them and say, hey, I've got to bring you to Jesus. The aim of the message is for us to understand we run into people a lot. And if we've been in the Word of God, evangelism is the heartbeat of the gospel and telling people about Christ. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you to examine your heart. Who is the last person you shared Jesus with? Who is it? Who's the person? Can you remember? Was it your doctor? Oh, they don't want Jesus. Listen, the doctor can give medicine to heal people, but that same physician one day will die and meet the great physician. Your lawyer? Is it the person at the bank? The post office? My family was doing an eight-day outdoor camp meeting. No running water, no electricity, funeral fans in the middle of a hot June. I understood why they had funeral fans. It had an address and a phone number. I thought this, this preacher is going to die and they're going to have to have a place to take my body when it's said and done. It was hot. We got there. They put us in a cabin. I'm on the backside of a forest in Ohio with my trailer hooked up to my car. And I can't turn around. So I'm having to go all the way around that big loop on that hillside. And I get halfway down and a man comes out and says, Now can you get up that hill with that trailer and that car? I had a two-wheel drive Suburban at that time. And I said, Well, I reckon I can. I can't turn around at this point. And he said, That's a big hill. He said, you sure better make sure you don't slow down. Well, I mean, uh, our heart starts going like this already. And I had to get to church to get our equipment set up. We're going to preach. We had to get there. We had to be in the right mood and everything else. And all of a sudden, I see this hill and I think, well, I can, I can do that. So we got over that hill. I thought, well, pfft. That wasn't nothing. And so we're just bouncing right along. And all of a sudden, I saw it. And it was like this. Mama Laura says, Floor it! And I pushed my foot down as fast as I could. And I mean, as I, oh, Caleb, I mean, my foot was on it. And we were going up that hill. And we was going up the hill. And we got to the top and it started going, <laughs> spinning out. I don't know if you know, but I'm hyper. And I said, it was Jesus was in the car. Jesus was in the car. I said, please get out of the car. <laughs> Sam, you'll get behind it. Don't let me run over you. Make a long story short. We spent about 40 minutes in the middle of a forest with one bar on our cell phone. He was able to get a hold of the pastor's son. Back the trailer halfway down, took the trailer off of the back of the car, took all of our equipment out, laid it in the forest floor, got the car down to the bottom, got the truck there, hooked up the trailer, pushed all the equipment back up while Vonda was watching us at the top of the hill. Vonda lived at the top of the hill. She's going, I tell all these Ohio deer hunters, they'll never get up this hill. They'll never get up this hill. I knew you're having trouble getting up the hill. People just can't get up this hill. And I'd listened to her for 40 minutes. There she was in the middle of the forest. Vonda, Samuel, me. There we are. A sweaty mess. And I believe it was the Holy Spirit. I hope it was. The, I believe it was. But I finally, we were ready to leave. And I, I, I looked over and I, I, I said, Vonda. I said, now I don't believe that I've spent 40 minutes on the side of this forest for no reason. And I said, I've got a question. 
Should you die before the sun rises tomorrow morning, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You say, boy, you're brass. Well, I figured I was there for something. I had three options right there. Now, she could have fallen right there by a log, and we, I'd had a great preaching story. Or I could drop the seed in her heart Amen. that somebody else come along and said, now you know Jesus loves you, don't you? And then some old crazy bald-headed preacher alongside the forest was up there saying, Bonda! I don't want to hear about you being religious. I want to know, do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? And I said, Bonda, this whole world is religious. Don't be religious. Make sure you've been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you know that? I heard her as I was walking down the hill. We need more people like that. We need more families like this. I thought, oh, Lord, help us. If there'd be more like me, that'd be a scary place, wouldn't it? <laughs> they brought this man to Jesus. They shared Jesus with this man. Jesus takes his fingers in the deaf man's ears. And whatever was binding his ears, uh, they were superstitious. And some of them said that maybe even Satan had a hold of this man's Ears causing him to be deaf. Whatever was holding a hold of that deafness, here comes the Son of Man, the Son of God. He's putting his fingers inside of this deaf man's ears. And that was broken. Whatever was binding that ear was broken. And the Lord spit, put his spit, the Lord put his spit on his, the Lord put his spit on his finger and put it in that man's mouth. I read that and I went, ooh. <laughs> and the Lord says, if it's worthy in my mouth, it's worthy in yours. I wonder what's coming out of your mouth. You take inventory real quick. The Lord healed that man. They brought the man to Jesus. He told him, don't go tell nobody. Don't tell nobody what I done. Well, that guy walked away saying, well, I said I wouldn't tell it to a living soul. How he brought salvation and he made me whole. But I found I couldn't hide right. such love as Jesus did impart. One more story. You see that guitar there? David Crow, the guy that's over the Free Will Baptist missions, <coughs> gave that to my son. He's given more, he gave my daughter a Gibson mandolin. And David pastored a boy named Richard. Richard called David. David pastored 600 people down in Cookville, Tennessee at the first. Free Will Baptist down in Cookville. And I hope I get this story somewhat right. His wife picks up the phone and she hears somebody on the other end with a broken tongue speaking to the degree that she couldn't understand what the person was saying. And she thought it, he, was a, he was a pervert. And she hung up on him. And the guy called back. Rick, Richard called back and David Crow picked up the phone and he talked to him for 45 minutes and found out the young boy had cerebral palsy and wanted to come to church. David said, I'll pick you up Sunday morning. David went to pick him up and he said, folks, I'm not being mean. He said, I had to crack my window in my car just to be able to breathe. He said he was filthy, dirty. He said, when I got to his house, his daddy was raking rocks in the yard and his mom was sitting on the front porch rocking back and forth. And here comes the boy with his crutches coming to my car. 
I take him to the church of 600 people at Cookville First Free Will Baptist. I told my deacons, you take care of him. He's my special guest. And they knew not to put anybody on the front row. He said, because I was one of those preachers every once in a while, I'd get happy in my preaching. And he said, I've been known to jump on the front row and just keep on a running as I'm preaching and jump off the row. He said, but when my deacon tried to sit Richard down that day in the third or fourth row back, Richard said, no front row. He said, I didn't realize Richard was there. I got caught up preaching that day. And he said, I, now, now folks, I've seen crazy stuff. This, and this man jumped on the front row. He looked, he said, there's Richard. He said, I jumped over him. I didn't know what else to do. I jumped over him. He said, I started taking him home. Got him to his house. And he said, I'll pick you up next week, Richard. He goes, no. He said, oh man, I've messed up. I scared him to death. He said, tonight, tonight, pick me up. He said, for several weeks I brought this boy who couldn't speak, who smelled, whose dad was doing the same thing, mom doing the same thing every week. He said, one day Richard come to the altar and asked Jesus Christ into his life. Amen. He said, I baptized him and I got supplies for him to even get cleaned up. Been there, done that. He said, then one day Richard come to me and said, I want to preach. He said, you want to preach? And he said, you want to preach because you're around me. He said, I want to preach. He said, no, Richard, you can't preach. He I want to preach. Finally, Pastor Dave said, I wouldn't, I could not take, he wasn't going to take no for an answer. I said, okay. And he said, I thought to myself, I'm going to make it so hard he won't do it. I said, you're going, to, you're going to sit with me. I'm going to give you a tape recorder. And I'm going to give you some cassette tapes. And if you get them stolen by your brothers or sisters, you're not going to get any more. And he said, I can tell you right now, you're going to practice and you're going to rehearse and you're going to go over and over your message before I ever allow you to get up in the pulpit. You're going to sit with me. He said, so the day came where me and him were to sit down and to go over the message. And I said, okay, Richard, we need a text. He said, Genesis 1. I said, no, that's too difficult. Let's find something else. Genesis 1. One. No, Richard, that's too deep. Genesis 1. He said, so I went to Genesis 1 and I began to write out in the beginning God. And he said, I went from the very first verse in Genesis 1 and I wrote out every verse until the very end of chapter 1. He said, a few weeks went down the road and, and he kept coming, when I'm going to preach? And not, not yet, not yet. And he said, finally his tapes had broken and he had told me his tapes were broken. He said, one day I walked into his house his daddy's a rocking, a raking, and his mom's a rocking. I just walked in by this point, and I pushed open the door, and there in a broken mirror, there's Richard going over his message, looking at himself, saying in his broken tongue the message that he's going to preach. He said, I had to bring my deacons together. He had, I think, 12 deacons. And he said, I brought them together and said, Men, you know Richard has been here, and you know, you know all about him. You know I've loved on him, and now the boy wants wants to preach and he said I, 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 boys I, I'm going to have to let him preach and one of them said uh, and he said I'm going to get him clothes and one of the deacons says no you're not and he thought oh man I made the deacons mad and the deacon says we're going to buy him his suit you take him and you get everything that he needs and you don't cut corners he got there he got him there to the place that, uh, and he bought him a suit and he said Richard look how great you look and Richard started going like this he didn't have a tie tack. He wanted a tie tack like the preacher. So the lady said, I buy him his tie tack. The, the lady there at the, at the store bought, bought him a tie tack. And then Richard looked down at David Crow. David wears cowboy boots. Everywhere you go, David's got cowboy boots on. He um, boots, I want boots, he wanted boots. So they bought him a pair of ostrich boots, I believe, is how it was. And now Richard's all ready to preach. Well, it had been a few weeks 
before this. And the pastor, Richard, uh, pastor David had asked one of the deacon's wives, said, I'm running late for church. Would you go pick up Richard for me? My wife and I can't get him. And she said, honey, I can't pick him up. We just bought a new Cadillac and I wouldn't dare have that smell in my car. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a, I've offended you. And I'm so sorry that I even asked you to pick up Richard. I'll, I'll never ask you to do that again. He said, so it came the night that I stood on the Sunday morning and said, people, you know Richard. And tonight, Richard is going to preach his message. He has worked with me and has told me that he's been called of God to preach. And he said, I want you to come and love on him like you would have loved on me. He said, as I stood back, as people began to file out, he said, one woman looked at me and she said, I'm so mad at you. And David looked at her and said, why are you mad at me? She said, I can't understand a thing that boy is saying. And how dare you allow him to get in a pulpit when we can't even understand him talking and you're allowing him to ruin our service. And he looked at her and he said, that could be your grandson. That could be your own child. And he said, I'm, I'm sorry you're offended, but he's preaching tonight. And he said, the evening came and I got up and I said, now it's time for Richard to come. And Richard put his, put his uh, little uh, crutches on and he made his way up to the pulpit and he took the crutches off and he laid them aside and he went back here to Genesis chapter 1 and he began to read he not only he didn't read he stood there and he looked at those people and he began to quote in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and he went through the whole chapter quote in the entire chapter and then he looked at them and he said all my life everybody tell me I'm nobody all my life everybody tell me I be no good I don't know how to do nothing his brother still my sisters do things and nobody think I'm any good but I read in Genesis where God made me good and God made me in his image David said all of a sudden the Holy Ghost of God came down and he said the spotlight of heaven shone right down on Pastor David's heart and he said God looked at me and said you've never worked that hard you've never studied that hard you've never fought that hard for a message and he said I literally got on my knees and I begin to crawl to the altar at the first free will Baptist in Cookville and he said before you know it there's over 300 people in the choir on the altars he said over here's a woman saying oh God I'm so sorry I wouldn't let him in my car over on the other side was a woman that said don't let that boy in the pulpit she said oh God forgive me for saying that he said that day the first free will Baptist church was forever changed because God can do good things with people that we don't think Thank God can do anything with. Amen. Amen. That lady who said he won't get in my car had to sell her car and give the proceeds to the missions. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Saying, I wonder what God can do with our stammering tongues if we'd get past the baby talk in the Bible. If we get past the what ifs and I can't help it. We get cases of I can't help it and we just run. We run this thing in the wrong thing way. I've not come to, I've not come to bash you people. I've come to try to inspire you, encourage you. I look at people like Caleb. I said, what's your story? Is it Michael? What's your name, good looking boy? Nicholas? Isn't he good looking? Tall? I can't stand people like that. He's got hair. Yeah, I heard that. What would it be like if everybody left this church tonight and you'd start looking at people a little bit different than what you've been looking at them? Is there a Richard in your life? Is there a Vonda? Is there somebody that God's putting in your life? A little nest that you need to pray over? 
God, help us. Father, you've heard us tonight. You've been with us. And we praise you. You've been good to us tonight. You've been good to the Lord family. You've been good to this church. And God, they have sought revival. They've been seeking your face. And Lord, you're big enough to fill every one of these pews with new people and bring all these people together. You can give a new harvest even in this congregation. You're not done with this church. Pastor Todd's going to need to be lifted up. And sometimes the best thing to say is nothing. And Lord, you'll give us wisdom on what to say and when to say it and how to say it. Lord, use us tonight, I pray. Help us to guard this little member that's a fire sometimes. In Jesus' name I pray. I don't know what this message has meant to you tonight. But I know with God all things are possible. Look up here at me. Don't you be the one that's holding a grudge against your brother and sister. Because you're bullheaded and stubborn and you won't go and ask forgiveness. Don't you be the one that came to me and asked me to take you to the funeral home to say your goodbyes to your daddy. Because you wouldn't do it while he was alive. Don't sit here and be mad at one another. Don't you go at work bad mouthing those at work. No, God's bigger than that. He can help us tonight. God wants you to go out and win the world. And I've left you with that charge. He left us with that charge. Let's stand together. Sing a verse and a chorus if you would. Let's sing it together. Let's sing it with her. You want to pray? In the hand of Jesus. You need to pray tonight. Let's not be afraid to come. Once come, let's mind the Lord tonight. And now I am no longer the same. He touched me. Let's sing it now. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. Oh, the joy. And I ask you a question do you really have a burden for your loss you'll never tell them about the Lord you don't have a burden for them oh God help us tonight bless your brother Let's sing together. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something wonderful happened. And now I know he touched me. Everybody smile. You're looking better. Thank you for your kindness to me. There's a guy in the back. Are you Darren? Guy in the back in the red. You look like a, you look like a guy from back home. I'm telling you from up here. God bless you. Thank you for being here. I'm going to call you Darren anyway. That'd be three Darrens in this place. That'd be scary, wouldn't it? No, that's great. God bless you. God bless you. 
Amen. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate that. What a great message tonight. I had heard that story by Brother David. Heard him preach it one night at a revival meeting in South Carolina. And awesome, awesome. It was just about as good tonight with you telling it. I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, but it's been good to be in church tonight. Amen. And uh, I hope that uh, you continue to pray for our revival. Please come back again tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. The Lord family will be singing and Brother Darren will be preaching. And uh, we look forward to seeing you here. If you're visiting with us tonight, thank you for coming. We have a good number. I know from Five Points tonight, appreciate you folks from, from Five Points being with us. And others, I'm, I'm scanning the crowd. I don't, I don't know if you're visiting or not, but I see some different, pla different faces from different places. Glad you're here. And uh, please come back tomorrow night. I'm going to ask uh, the, the pastor of our Five Points Church, Brother David, if he will, to dismiss us in prayer. Continue to pray. Uh, for Brother Todd uh, and his family throughout uh, the night and the next couple of days. Also, I'm going to give you a quick update, all right? And uh, I'm going to make it short. I'm going to be short, okay? Um, you've been here a while. I'm going to tell you, we went to the oncologist today, and many of you know that they um, canceled her um, biopsy. And um, we went today, and we were wondering what in the world's going on, and we were told, well, there's just nothing there to biopsy. Um, it's, she still got it, okay? But whatever they've done, the medicine, the radiation, the, uh, the hormone um, therapy that she's on is working, but I believe it's prayer. I believe it's the Lord, and we give him praise for that. And we asked today about chemotherapy, uh, and, and our oncologist said, there's no need to do chemotherapy if what we're doing is working. Now, if things got worse, then we go to the next level. So keep praying, okay? Keep praying. Now, we will still go to therapy to help her with her mobilization, things of that nature. But God's working. Thank you for your prayers. And just keep praying, okay? To him be glory. Amen? Amen. Thank you for being here. Brother David, you dismiss us in prayer and consider yourself dismissed after he's done.